Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Hearing. I'm Brian Taylor. This week, we're going to be talking about online reviews. I think most of us know uh, and are familiar with the process of writing in uh, online reviews. Uh, we might do it ourselves, make a review of a restaurant or an experience we had. And uh, even more of us are probably relying on online reviews before we go to a restaurant or even before we visit our, a doctor or a dentist. I know myself, I relied on online reviews uh, more and more uh, over the last few years. They've become a really important tool. And uh, online reviews are actually something that I think uh, hearing care professionals need to pay attention to. And there's been some research done in that area. And that's uh, what prompted me to bring on our guest today, uh, Dr. Vinay Manchaya, who is a professor at the University of Colorado Medical School. I'm going to let uh, I'm going to welcome uh, Benet to the uh, to the broadcast today. Welcome. Well, thank you, Brian. My pleasure to be here. Um, I do read the blog, and I've seen plenty of these videos, and I really enjoy watching them. So, thank you for hosting me today. Well, it's good to know that people are watching our stuff. <laughs> um, you're one of the most prolific researchers that I know. Uh, every time I go to one of the journals, it seems like I see another article that you wrote. And so much of it is germane to clinical practice. And I think one area is what we're going to talk about today, online reviews. But before we get into that topic, uh, I thought it would be really helpful for our viewers if you could uh, give us a little bit about your background. Okay. Well, I started as a clinician, uh, audiologist, you know, worked um, in the clinical environment for some time. Uh, but much of my last uh, 10, 12 years are, uh, you know, most of my efforts are in the academic space uh, with academic jobs, uh, teaching, research. Uh, but I've always enjoyed clinical work. So I've kept up my clinical work throughout my career. Currently, I serve as the professor in the medical school here in the University of Colorado. I also have a leadership position uh, as the director of audiology in the University of Colorado Hospital. So I kind of oversee the audiology clinics here. Uh, in addition to that, I also do a little bit of clinical work. In terms of my research, uh, I've been all over the place, uh, you know, looking at different things and uh, each year and each you know, couple of years, my interest changes and sway to a different direction. Uh, but I would say in the last few years, uh, there is definitely more focused efforts on uh, internet, virtual spaces, you know, telehealth. Um, so these are my main uh, areas. And um, I co-lead the lab, virtual hearing lab. You know, if you're interested, you can just Google virtual hearing lab and you can go to the website. I co-lead this with uh, Professor David Swanapul in South Africa. So uh, we are really interested in kind of understanding what happens in the virtual space, what kind of tools that we can develop that can supplement our clinical um, investigations. And how can we provide some, uh, you know, rehabilitation as well uh, in this uh, uh, using the internet and virtual spaces? So we're interested in everything that happens online. Well, and that's why we have you on the broadcast today. There's actually a lot of different topics we can talk about with you today, but the one I wanted to focus on is uh, consumer-driven healthcare and uh, people's desire to seek information online uh, to get advice online. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the first question for you, Benet, is what motivated you to um, get into that uh, area of study? So a few different things. Uh, I think the initial interest in this basically started from my clinical experience as well as research. Uh, for example, you know, uh, I started developing and evaluating internet interventions, mainly for tinnitus, now also for vestibular disorders you know, developing um, self-management programs that people could take on the internet and then uh, looking at how their outcomes may substantially improve uh, and so on. And one of the things that happened there was people would read quite broadly and send us questions on, on, on a, a range of things that we never thought about. And also clinically, uh, you know, for instance, I recall several years ago, uh, a patient asking me, you know, uh, individual with tinnitus asking me, Oh, where can I get a laser therapy for tinnitus? And can you recommend me a place? And I had never heard, you know, what is a laser therapy for tinnitus? And then I kind of took some time to go look at PubMed and uh, uh, and then tell him that, well, I never heard of it, but it looks like there's very limited evidence. So I can't really recommend that you do this. Mm -hmm. So that kind of prompted my uh, interest in virtual spaces. 
started thinking about, you know, it seems like people are spending a lot of time online looking for information and that is driving their uh, um, you know, interest as well as decision-making. So maybe it is worth for us to look into those spaces. But at that time, I really didn't have any expertise on how to do any, anything meaningful. Um, and then something else happened. Interestingly, I, col I collaborated with some sociologists in Sweden, uh, understanding hearing loss from a new theor theoretical perspective. Now, for example, much of the research on hearing loss and hearing aids are driven by stigma theory, which has some limitations. So we started looking at hearing loss and hearing aids from a new theoretical perspective called social representation theory. And uh, uh, as a part of that, uh, we started applying some new methodologies, like looking at text data, you know, how to analyze text data using modern uh, analytical tools, softwares, uh, so that we can look for patterns. So that gave me some insights into some methodologies. Uh, and then I thought, well, you know, this is pretty cool. So we should, uh, you know, how about we apply this to, you know, Facebook data, newspaper data, and pretty much everything I can think of. <laughs> And then the third uh, most important thing that happened was probably me moving to the US about seven, eight years ago and uh, uh, looking at what's happening here in terms of technological advancement uh, for direct-to-consumer hearing dev devices and service delivery innovations. Um, and then, um, I don't know how, but I got introduced to Abraham Bailey, uh, CEO of Hearing Tracker, and then we started discussing. Uh, and I think um, that also kind of, uh, really strengthened my interest on uh, looking at online spaces, virtual uh, spaces, and then look at like reviews and so on. So, uh, you know, a few of these different things, clinical, some introduction to methodology, and then connection with hearing tracker, all of that, I think, came on a right time yeah, uh, for us to start work on this area. So, yeah, and I know, I know Abram Bailey at Hearing Tracker collects an awful lot of data that he does great work mm -hmm. down there in Austin. Um, what I wanted to focus on were three studies uh, that you did in this area around online reviews. The first that I know of, the one I wanted to talk about first, at least, was published in IJA, International Journal of Audiology, I think uh, last year. Uh, the title of the study, I have it here, is Hearing Aid Acquisition and Ownership. Uh, what can we learn from online consumer reviews? Uh, can you tell us what you did in that study? Uh, well, this is our uh, data from Hearing Tracker. Um, uh, in this, we had about 1,400 um, online reviews uh, uh, on hearing aids. So uh, when we looked at that data, basically we had uh, three types of things. You know, one, we had some information about um, uh, the metadata, like what type of brand, uh, the technology level they were using, and then how long they were using these hearing aids. The second information that we had was... Um, um, you know, user rating for 10 different things uh, in terms of their hearing aid performance, benefit and satisfaction, where they would rate on a structured scale. And the third important element that we also had was, you know, text data where people would actually write, hearing aid users would write their experiences uh, as a review. So um, uh, we were looking at this data and uh, interested in understanding, you know, uh, does that tell us anything about Hearing aid and benefit, you know, hearing aid benefit and satisfaction. Now we kind of measure this in the clinical scenario, uh, um, typically using questionnaires, standardized questionnaires. Uh, but if you have a, a text data, um, you know, what does that tell us? Uh, so we took this data, we applied uh, some natural language processing, uh, basically automated way of looking for some patterns or themes within the data. Uh, to find meaningful units from this text data. And we also kind of linked that, we kind of looked at association between this text data uh, with these ratings. Uh, you know, just to see uh, if you do the rating, uh, like a structured as standardized questionnaire, and look at the text data, will they tell you the same thing? Or is there something more that comes out of the text data? Uh, so yeah, this is exactly what we did in that study. So yeah, and I know. So if you go to this, so when you talk about text data and the, and, and analytics around it, uh, for our viewers out there, and maybe and this is just for my own mm. information. When you look at it, the charts, it's like the, the words or the phrases that are are uh, written the most have big letters, and then uh, things that are not written as as much have smaller letters. So you get this infographic that's kind of interesting yeah. as far as what's been yeah yeah said in the reviews right so two things there one of course it does look at the frequency how uh, frequently something comes up 
but what is more important is actually not the frequency but interrelatedness mm-hmm. um you, you know one way of looking at the text data is like uh, we uh, read each statement and we code them uh, like qualitatively what does it say and then analyzing that data uh, but uh, we have uh, really good tools nowadays to kind of do that automatically you know you can kind of read 100 people's responses but if you have 100000 responses you know you can't read them and, and it should take yeah. forever so can we meaningfully analyze them using the softwares and uh, the answer is yes we are getting you know closer and closer to do that and uh, in addition to the frequency it also looks for themes you know specific right. patterns you know what they're talking about so well and it's so in this first study that i mentioned uh, that you mm-hmm. kind of briefed us on can you tell us what you found well several interesting things you know first thing uh, the cluster analysis of text data resulted in uh, uh, six clusters but mainly kind of two domains one uh, people were talking about uh, device acquisition uh, like you know finding the right provider right type of device selecting hearing glass to suit their type of hearing problem they had uh, and so on and then the second main theme was uh, device use you know uh, quite a lot of discussion around smartphone connectivity uh, you know adjusting their uh, hearing aid through smartphone and also hearing in noise so that so you know these are all some of the main things that themes that came out of this data another really interesting thing for me was um when we look at the quantitative rating that is you know rating for structured questionnaires um nearly 80% of them have good benefit or satisfaction you know rating good or very good in, in you know in a five point scale but when we look at this specific text data we actually see quite a lot of issues people reporting of course they're satisfied with their hearing aid but they still have issues so uh, i think the interesting thing is just because you're uh, happy with hearing it doesn't mean you have no issues so <laughs> it does you know um, indicate that i think we need to look deeper and another thing that also came out you know we also looked at association between um these ratings and then the themes you know so is there any relation between the ratings and the themes and um, um in that particular analysis we kind of look at uh, in you know in some themes is there over or under representation of some of these ratings and um, for one of the themes for example uh, finding the right provider price point and and so on we kind of saw whenever people talk about that they have really low rating rating of 1 2 and 3 uh that means if they have problem finding the right person they're looking for finding the right type of device they they're going to leave a, a really bad review so uh we i mean this is a i would say as a bird side view we need to get to the bottom of this but uh, in the first study we just wanted to kind of understand what people were saying and um how does their text data relates to their uh, quantitative ratings so, yeah it's pretty interesting how uh we what people here in the clinic as far as complaints from one you know one and two individuals it's just interesting how you, that happens in the clinic and then what you see kind of writ large when you start pooling all of that data across thousands of users all over the country it's pretty interesting um was there anything in that if i remember right that aja study uh about uh hearing and background noise right that was a real um, yeah yeah so that was also one of the dominant themes um one thing that we did not do in this you know we did not look at uh, whether people were talking negatively about background noise or positively about background noise but just looking at the statements i can say they were talking about both both positively and negatively you know the quite a lot of people saying oh how cool this new hearing aid is compared to my previous hearing aids you know it can i can do much better in the background noise mm-hmm. and also plenty of people saying oh i still struggle quite a lot with my background noise and it's not you know my hearing it is no good in background noise and so on Uh, so yeah that's an interesting finding and it it does have some implications for us uh, you know i think one implication may be that uh, well technology has changed advanced tremendously and it has definitely helped background noise you know deal with background noise but i think we may be placing too much emphasis on that and i think it may be a time for us to advocate for you know better living spaces uh you know improve on the acoustics of the space so that is one and and second maybe is also thinking about the, all the accessories that we can use you know coupling with hearing aids uh that can uh you know help users to deal better in the background noise yeah and that's really interesting because 
I think it speaks to the limitation of technology, of hearing aids. Uh, when you get into these really adverse signal to noise ratios, it's, I guess, maybe for all of us in industry, maybe it's a little bit unrealistic to think that the hearing aid itself can um, do everything. Um, mm -hmm. And I really like the point you make that maybe we need to focus a little bit more on improving the acoustics of the room, um, uh, accessories that can help lower the signal to noise ratio. So it's more than just good signal processing in the hearing aid. There's other things that we, we sometimes forget. And it's, you know, the importance of these reviews, I think, is that it kind of shines a light on, on, a, on a theme that you're mm -hmm. hearing in, in multiple places. So uh, it, it speaks to the power of your research and how it applies to what happens in the clinic. It's really getting mm -hmm. good information. Um, which, which leads me to the, to the second study um, that was published uh, just a couple of weeks ago at AJA, American Journal of Audiology. Uh, and I have the title of that study here in front of me because I want to make sure I get it right. Mm -hmm. um, Online Reviews of Hearing Aid Acquisition and Use, a Qualitative Thematic Analysis. Um, so based on that study, it sounds like you're looking more at where's, um, what they experience after they've acquired hearing aids. Uh, so can you tell us about the second study that was in AJA? What, uh, what did you do in this study? So this is a, a follow-up study basically using the same hearing tracker data and hearing aid reviews. So when we did the text pattern analysis, we kind of learned something new, but um, um, we kind of felt that we are getting a bird's eye view of the data, not necessarily a granular view of the data. So we thought it would be interesting for us to uh, do a traditional qualitative analysis, like read, read every single statement that users has made, assign a meaning unit on what they're saying, uh, and then see how that relates to this quantitative data. Like, you know, is the qualitative analysis traditionally we've been doing, is it similar to this quantitative new metrics that we have? Uh, and also what additional things that we can learn from this uh, analysis? Um, um, yeah, so... That's exactly what we did in, in the study. And um, in terms of the findings, yeah, what uh, did you find? uh, very interesting findings. Um, you know, in the bird's eye view, the, the text pattern analysis, we had found six main themes. But when we look closely at the data, we actually found 11 themes and 136 sub themes. So that is crazy. That means if you look very closely at the data, people are actually talking about a you know, bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can't limit them to you know two or three main topics. Um, of course, there are some main dominant topics, but uh, uh, people talk about a range of different things. And that's why I think it is important for us to go to that granularity of the data. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the qualitative analysis kind of reinforced um, the, the quantitative analysis. Because if you look at the main themes, uh, you know, uh, if from the qualitative, it still boils down to the clinical processes, you know, getting hearing tested, you know, how they got hearing aids, the device, you know, type of device, uh, the performance of the device, physical appearance, fit, and things like that. And then the person, you know, what is their experience and knowledge? Uh, you know, were they satisfied with the, with the device? Uh, how, you know, if they have any changes in their quality of life, things like that. So it kind of boils down to the main themes, but we can get to a lot more granularity uh, reading and understanding the statements. Some other, like one other really interesting thing that happened to uh, us in this was when we were coding, you know, when we were reading this data, we also coded whether the statements were positive, uh, neutral, negative, or if it is more like an advice giving for future hearing aid, uh, you know, uh, buyers or, or owners. And we found that, um, you know, about 60, just over 60% of the statements are positive, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, nearly 30% of the uh, of the statements were uh, actually negative. About six seven percent was neutral, and about two percent was like a, an advice giving. So this is also an interesting finding because when we look at that single number of benefit and satisfaction, uh, you know, eighty percent plus indicate good or very good. But when mm -hmm. we actually look at the statements, then nearly only sixty percent, just over sixty percent, have positive, uh, you know, statements and the rest are negative and neutral. So it does kind of speak to that earlier point that we made on saying, when we ask people to say, maybe they can give more details than a single number that we arrive from these questionnaires. Yeah, that's really interesting because I know that the last few market track surveys, um, 
say an overall satisfaction rating of 80 some percent. Yeah. So you're saying that sort of high level, top level, if you ask that simple question, you're getting the same thing. But if you dig into the details, you start to see that number drop a little bit. Yeah, no, that's exactly what we found in the online reviews. Um, and I, again, the sampling is very different from market track and here. But the interesting thing is when we do the same type of measurements, we get the same, you know, 80% satisfaction, right? So uh, there is definitely more to learn from this angle. And in fact, we have a current project looking into, uh, can we use natural language uh, to understand benefit and satisfaction? Uh, and again, we are uh, doing this project uh, under the virtual hearing lab, and we have a, uh, a, a researcher in South Africa together with uh, David Swanapul, mm -hmm. basically looking into can we gather text information from uh, you know um, hearing aid users, and uh, how does that may relate to our, our standardized questionnaires? And the text information may be very useful because depending on what they say, one, we can understand their benefit and satisfaction. But in addition to that, we can also maybe help fine tune the hearing aids, which we cannot do just using a number rating, right? So um, I think there is definitely more value in getting more textual data or, uh, or a first hand reports of hearing aid users. Yeah, that's really interesting because it kind of speaks to the value of machine learning and on gathering all these large pools of data mm -hmm. and then taking that data and then applying it at the clinical level with an individual. Mm -hmm. um, I can see how you know, knowing this information in the clinic can help you uh, drive satisfaction to a higher number mm -hmm. with the individuals that you see in your clinic when you have these details. Mm -hmm. So that's great. That brings me to the third study uh, that I wanted to talk about today. And that was published last year in JAAA. Uh, and that's one that looked at, I know this one pretty well because at, in my role at Signia, uh, we've talked about this study in, in different um, white papers and things to kind of build the case around um, what consumers uh, want and uh, look for in their hearing aids. But in this JAAA study, you uh, looked at uh, consumer ratings of, this number is really high, 15,000 uh, people. So uh, tell us what you found in the study that evaluated almost 15,000 consumer reviews. Yeah, so this, again, the data comes from Hearing Tracker, you know, thanks to all of their efforts in gathering good data and uh, you know, helping us do some of this uh, interesting work. Mm -hmm. um, but the data comes from a particular uh, algorithm they have or a tool they have called Help Me Choose. Now, that means when people go to this website, uh, the consumers or patients go to their website, they can go and uh, um, uh, take this tool. Uh, it's more like a decision aid. So what it basically does is ask users, you know, well, uh, depending on what are the, your preferences, we can tell you what hearing aid may be more suitable for you. So they basically ask a bunch of questions and, uh, oh, for this feature, you know, uh, do you, uh, how, how necessary that is for you? And they do the same thing for a bunch of them. And then based on, at the end of that, they have a algorithm that tells them, oh, here is a hearing aid that is suitable for you. So in some way, this is actually a pretty good data because when we do questionnaire studies, we don't know if the users are really reading them and answering them truthfully. Whereas if they're actually wanting to know what hearing aid is good, then I'm pretty confident that they're answering these questions more truthfully. And, you know, so we took this 15,000 user data and uh, we had a couple of different things. We didn't have much demographic data, like age, gender, that would have been very helpful. But at that time, the purpose of collecting this data was not to do a study. So they didn't collect the data, but we had uh, user ratings on more than 20 hearing aid attributes. And many of, for many of these, we have no particular previous data, like for example, rechargeability, you know, and, uh, Bluetooth connectivity. So maybe some small scale focus groups when you know companies are developing this, but we didn't have anything large scale. So that was interesting for me. Mm -hmm. So in that study, we did a few things. One, we descriptively looked at uh, which of these features are most desirable or less desirable. Uh, and then uh, are there some elements that may uh, relate to how their their desirability goes, you know? And then third, uh, we also did a cluster analysis to look at, you know, are there patterns in hearing aid users based on their preferences? Mm -hmm. You know, so this is really important for, um, for clinicians as well as for uh, manufacturers, you know, uh, and this is being done in 
uh, you know, every uh, industry, like if you go to Walmart or some others, they'll have all of our data and they can kind of look at, you know, are there unique consumers? Right. And if you buy one thing, are you likely to buy something else? You know, like, for example, if you go as a student, you know, you may buy milk and some fruit and some snack or whatever, whatever. You know, if you go somebody else, then so are there some specific patterns within this data? So that's very interesting. So we kind of looked at the dis- descriptive data of more or less desi- you know, desirable features yeah, and then looked at subgrouping these users. So I, I guess the million dollar question is, what did you find from these almost 15,000 consumers? Uh, well, I'll, I'll be brief. You know, there's uh, plenty of things that we could talk, uh, but I think uh, in terms of the most desirable attributes, uh, you know, it kind of comes down to four things. One, uh, ability to hear friends and family in quiet uh, and ability to hear friends and family in noise. You know, those are like the top rated. And then in addition to that, uh, two other things that came out was actually comfort, uh, you know, and reliability, you know. So, of course, we are focusing on a bunch of new things. But at the end of the day, I think what people really care is, you know, is your hearing it reliable? Uh, is it comfort, you know, comfortable for you to wear? And can you hear your friends and family in quiet and noise? So exactly. nothing surprising there, but it kind of really strengthens, you know, those are our core values. You know, the, right, exactly. Uh, that is what should kind of, we should keep as a base. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are plenty of other things that people rated, uh, you know, less desirably, for example, you know, streaming, uh, uh, um, streaming to hearing it from your uh, landline. That was not highly desirable because no, who, who uses landline these days? And, you know, there are a few other things that were less desirable, but um, it kind of just gives us an understanding of um, which features uh, and which population may be interested in which features. But the right. second point, which population, we didn't mm-hmm. have much data, like, you know, you know, are men more likely to like some, are women more likely to, you know, prefer some features, are educated more likely to prefer, are people with this background. So we didn't have that, but we have the data now because we put in some new information and uh, uh, we have 5,000 users data now we're starting to analyze. So we may be able to tell more in the coming months. In terms of the second important finding is uh, when we did the cluster analysis, very interestingly, we only found two clusters and two groups of people. One, a group of users, one third of the population, nearly 5,000 of this 15,000 sample, they wanted a high-end technology. They wanted everything. You know, it's like buying a fully loaded car. You know, mm-hmm. they wanted a hearing aid fully loaded and they were happy to pay a premium price for that. You said one third, right? Yeah, one third of that. And mm-hmm. uh, whereas two thirds of the users were uh, more um, choosy, you know, they kind of wanted uh, different uh, things, you know, specific uh, preferences and, and things like that. So this is the pattern that we found, but I think I'm still not very convinced that this was a good finding because I think our grouping only goes far if you only put that preferences rating. But if you maybe add some other information, like, you know, maybe degree of hearing loss or self-reported hearing loss, age, gender, uh, income level, you know, uh, other things, maybe that can give us a better grouping or a segmentation of this population. Uh, That's what we are hoping to do in the next few months. Do you think that these attributes could change over time and or could they be based on user demographics? I think, uh, yeah, I think you asked two very important questions. I think, um, of course, the hearing aid preferences, at, uh, preferences to different attributes will relate to some demographic. We don't know which one they are, and we'll be able to answer some of those questions in the future. Uh, and I am also pretty confident that the trends change all the time. You know, uh, For example, in our previous study, uh, one of the attributes, like adjusting hearing aids from home, like programming hearing aid from home was not rated very desirably because the data was pre-2019. Mm-hmm. And I think looking at the new data, I'm pretty confident that now after the pandemic, many users probably would want to have that you know, feature in their hearing aid. So uh, I think this can um, help. I mean, this is an area that where we have to look for trends over time, for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. So I, our time is running out here. So my final question to you, Vinay, is... Um, I really want to have you your take on the big picture. Um, so taking these three studies as a whole um, and all of your work around consumer uh, online reviews, um, how does this research uh, better inform uh, audiologists or clinicians out there? And uh, how can they apply 
your research findings uh, to their daily work. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, Brian, for this uh, very important question. You know, I mean, these three studies, but I, I may also add a few other studies that we have done. Like, for example, we have looked at um, Google reviews about hearing healthcare professionals. You know, we sampled about 40,000, um, uh, you know, reviews and uh, looked at like, um, how, what are people saying about their audiologists? We looked at uh, Facebook data and other data. And I think it's right time for research in this space, uh, uh, looking at all the things that are going on in terms of over-the-counter hearing aid, direct-to-consumer movement, you know, in healthcare. I think it's kind of right time for us to start looking into this, both uh, big data from research, but also individually uh, in your clinic, because, you know, um, um, it is important for you to know what's going on in your own setting and what type of feedback users are providing. I think a word of caution is um, we got to be extremely cautious what type of inferences or conclusions that we draw um, because of many reasons. You know, first being there is obviously a sampling bias, like a self-selection bias. You know, people who are either extremely happy or unhappy are more likely to leave. Uh, so that is one uh, important thing. And also, um, if you're only focusing on online reviews, there is also a lot of news about uh, fake reviews. You, you know, so uh, I think we've got to be mindful on what kind of inferences we can draw. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think my take on this is that it's definitely an area that we should focus, even if there is some of, even though some of this data is actually fake. You know, why? Because it is driving future sales, future service delivery. So at an individual level, let's say you have a you know consumer leaving a feedback that you don't recognize, then maybe you need to go and ask a follow-up questions and you know try to kind of identify who they are. And um, but at a at a larger scale, that we have some new tools that can help figure out based on the authenticity of the writing. You know if that is a, a genuine review or a you know a fake review. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's definitely time for us to look into this. The second point I would like to make is, I think we need to develop methodologies that can help us meaningfully analyze and uh, understand this data. Because we looked at about 1,400 reviews, uh, but I think in coming years, it'll be hundreds of thousands of reviews, not like, you know, not in hundreds of thousands, it'll be hundreds of thousands. So how can we make meaningful sense of this really, really large data? You know, that'll be a challenge for uh, researchers to develop algorithms that can help us think meaningfully. Mm -hmm. But I see a huge value both for clinicians as well as for industry, because when we look at technology turnaround, you know, I think hearing a technology turnaround has become somewhat like a smartphone turnaround. You know, we have something new comes up every year. Mm -hmm. When we look at clinical research, like clinical trials, there is no way we can keep up. You know, to do conceptualize an idea, get an IRB, collect data, write, publish, it takes years. Right, right. And to get anything meaningful, I mean, we need few studies to make a meaningful sense. It would take decades, you know, and by then we have kind of moved on from some technology and gone to something else. So I think the only way we could make any inferences about these new technologies are, are basically using this uh, consumer data. Mm -hmm. Again, I know we've got to be cautious, but I think if we can find uh, a way to meaningfully analyze the data, it can have a really good effect on the industry. Like, you know, what kind of technology are we building? and how useful these are. And can we actually, before it comes in the next round within one year, can we make some small adjustment that can really fix things based on the user perspective? So I think there is a huge value, uh, definitely more work, work needs to be done in this in this space. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, right on target. Um, you know, there's no way that traditional research can keep up with uh, the uh, product launch cycle Mm -hmm. And so being able to collect the data quickly like this uh, through online reviews not only helps people in industry, but it also helps clinicians, I think, do a better job with individuals that come into their office, uh, knowing where some of the some of their uh, struggles or some of their challenges might be. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really, I think, fuels better patient care when you have access to this uh, all of this data. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, thanks to you and your colleagues for all the, the, the great work that you've done, all the contributions you've made in this area. Um, I look forward to, and I'm sure our viewers do as well, look forward to reading more um, of this uh, research as you publish it. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Brian. And also, I just want to acknowledge uh, a truly interdisciplinary international team that we have. Uh, 
you know, Abraham Bailey hearing tracker, uh, a researcher Pierre Ratinard is a social scientist in France, a uh, Beck Bennett in Australia, you know, Erin Pico in Vanderbilt, and also um, uh, finally, but most importantly, David Swanepoel in South Africa. I think all of their effort really helped me, you know, get this out fairly quickly. You know, it would have taken many years to do this, but we were able to get it done fairly quickly because of this team effort. But thank you oh. for uh, your interest and, uh, and uh, thank you all for watching. Takes a village, as they say. All right. Well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it.